We pride ourselves in EMS on managing trauma patients. We're particularly good at managing airways, right? I mean, after all, just ask us. So how often do you think we miss an esophageal intubation these days? I don't mean inadvertently placing the tube in the esophagus and then immediately recognizing it. That happens to all of us. No, I mean placing it in the esophagus and not recognizing it. How often does that still happen? What about clinically significant pneumothoraces? Do you think we're pretty good at recognizing and treating those? What about pericardial tamponade? Well, I just came across a new paper that can shed a bit of light on these questions. Stick around, we'll get into the details. What is a lighthouse? It is a tower with a bright light at the top, located at an important or dangerous place. The main purpose of a lighthouse is to serve as a navigational aid and to warn of dangerous areas. Welcome to the EMS Lighthouse Project podcast. Illuminating the darkness of current EMS clinical practice with the bright light of science. Here's your host, Dr. Jeff Jarvis. Howdy, y'all. I'm Dr. Jeff Jarvis. Welcome back to another episode of the EMS Lighthouse Project podcast, where we shine the bright light of science on the darkness of current EMS clinical practice. So I've got a quick episode for you today. I want to do this one not because I think the paper I have for you is particularly groundbreaking, but mostly because one item from this paper caught my eye in the abstract. And also because my son Jeremy is home from Texas State for the summer, he thinks he might be interested in learning to edit these videos and podcast. Now I'm obviously hoping he loves it and is great at it. If so, he gets a job, and I might finally be able to put these episodes out as regularly as Rob and Casey get out the MCHD podcast. Not that I'm jealous or anything, but mostly because I'd love to have something else to work with him on. Speaking of work with him, he talked me into taking an online Python programming class with him, and both of us are enjoying it. I'm really proud of the emerging nerd coming out of my son. Speaking of nerds, I'm also proud of my daughter, Sydney, who is starting grad school in epidemiology. She wants a career in EMS research. I'm not sure where she gets that idea, but thanks to Remley for being a great role model for her. So about that paper. Much of the literature around EMS intubation has always focused on the risk of unrecognized esophageal intubation, and rightly so. But... Advocates for EMS intubation, like, say, me, for example, say that most of that literature on the frequency of these adverse events dates back to when we were exclusively using direct laryngoscopy without RSI or DSI, and we depended on breath sounds and misting in ET tubes, pulse oximetry to confirm tube placement. Well, times have changed. We now have video laryngoscopy and RSI. We have DSI. We have waveform entitled CO2. And we know that that is the standard of care for tube placement confirmation. Unrecognized esophageal intubation, it just doesn't happen anymore. Or does it? So the paper I want to talk to you today about is titled Characteristics of Fatal Blunt Injuries Using Postmortem computed tomography. It's by Dr. Jeremy Levin and his colleagues at the Indiana University School of Medicine. It's published in the Journal of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery and is in press right now. This was a single center retrospective study from Indianapolis. And I bring up the Indy part because today, Sunday the 28th, was Indy 500. Congrats to Joseph Newgarden and the Penske team on an exciting last minute win. A lot of red flags. So the point of this paper was to describe characteristics of adult patients with blunt trauma who died within an hour of arrival at the trauma center. Now that hour is either an hour before in the field or an hour after in the emergency department. Patients also needed to have gotten a postmortem CT scan of 
basically everything. These were non-contrast pan scans and have potential value when formal autopsies are not available. They're obviously not a substitute for an autopsy, but they're certainly more available, and they can provide useful information on the injury patterns that can hopefully translate into useful clinical improvements in care. That's what they're hoping to do here, is find things that we can do to improve care. Maybe we can identify missed injuries and do something to pick those up. Now, the primary outcome of interest here was the prevalence of what they called mortal injuries. Now, they define this as exsanguination from moderate to large hemoperitoneum or hemothorax, retroperitoneal hematoma, or high-grade pelvic fracture. They also included traumatic brain injury and cervical spine injuries as what they called mortal injuries. So their secondary outcome was what they called potentially mortal injuries. These are the things that could have been potentially reversed in the field or the emergency department. They include things like airway misplacement, moderate to large pneumothorax, etc. They described the rate of both mortal and potentially mortal injuries and then compared these rates between the two groups, those who lost pulses prior to ED arrival and those who lost pulses after ED arrival. Before we get to the results and takeaways, remember this is a sample of patients that is highly susceptible to selection bias. There may have been a reason that some patients received a postmortem scan and others didn't, others that were not included in this paper at all. We really know very little about how those patients who got the PAN scan and those patients who didn't, we don't know how they differ. Also remember they only looked at adults with blunt trauma who died either in the field or rapidly upon arrival to the emergency department. In other words, not necessarily a group we can easily extrapolate findings from. With that in mind, why do you think we should even focus on this paper? Well, primarily because it gives me a chance to reinforce what I think are very important parts about caring for trauma patients. We'll get to these points in a bit, but let's briefly hit on the results. Over a nine-year period, they obtained post-mortem CT scans on 91 patients, of whom they excluded 11 for having penetrating trauma or other reasons that they had set out ahead of time. Things like injuries arising from domestic injury, for example, things that their IRB, I suspect, made them exclude. Now, that left 80 patients to analyze. Overall, there was no significant difference between those who died before ED arrival and those who died after ED arrival, either in the group they called mortal injuries or the group they called potentially mortal injuries. Now, I'm honestly not sure that there was really much of a point in doing that comparison. I suspect maybe they felt the need to, I don't know, science it up a bit just to get it past peer review. And that's a shame because sometimes a simple descriptive paper can be valuable and useful. And I think this paper is a simple descriptive paper, and I think it's useful. I think it's valuable. Here's what I found interesting. TBI, that was the most common mortal injury at around 40%, followed by hemothorax, hemoperitoneum, and pelvic fracture. 43% of all patients were intubated, 16% had some type of LMA placed, and 14% had a chemo-LT placed. Now, of those airways, and this is the important part, 14% were found to be misplaced. 11 of those were from intubations, 2.5% of them were from King LTs, and there were no misplaced LMAs. Now, the interesting thing is that 14% of misplaced airways, that tracks almost to the letter of what my predecessor at MedStar in Fort Worth found looking at King LTs. He found 14% of those that were placed had inadequate entitled CO2 that were indicative of misplaced airways. So I think that number, when you see the same number in different places, I suspect that might mean something. Now, of those, say, 11% of intubations that were misplaced, 5% of them were unrecognized esophageal intubations. 
And that's the key point that I want to get at. 5% of misplaced endotracheal tubes were in the esophagus and it was not recognized. Now, knowing that waveform entitled CO2 is essentially 100% sensitive and specific for tracheal placement, there really is no excuse for 5% unrecognized esophageal intubation rates. So I can think of maybe two reasons that this can still be happening. Number one, people are not using entitled CO2, despite it clearly being the standard of care. And number two, they're using it, but they're ignoring it. Both of these reasons are very, very dangerous, and we need to stop it. So just so y'all don't think that this thing that I'm saying, where entitled CO2 is the standard of care for airway confirmation, I want to point out that there are several publications recently who have made this statement very clear. And when people are trying to decide what the standard of care is, they go to the literature. So one source was the recent National Association of EMS Physicians, NAMSP, Airway Compendium. There were multiple papers in that compendium that were crystal clear on this. Waveform in tidal CO2 is the standard of care for confirming endotracheal tube placement, for confirming supraglottic placement, and for monitoring its ongoing function. Now, in addition to that, there have been some recent publications that were published on this and also make this same point. One of them is a really nice paper in JSEP Open. I mean, it just came out. It's by Dr. Sackles, Ross, and Kovacs, and it's titled Preventing Unrecognized Esophageal Intubation in the Emergency Department. Now, there's another one. It's published in Anesthesia by Dr. Nicholas Crimes. It's titled Preventing Unrecognized Esophageal Intubation, a Consensus Guideline from the Project for Universal Management of Airways. Both of these are great papers, and they both offer two very clear recommendations. Number one, again, they repeat waveform in tidal CO2 is the standard of care for intubation placement confirmation and monitoring. And their second, their second recommendation for avoiding esophageal intubation is the routine use of video laryngoscopy. Now, I'm sure y'all probably know I am all in on Team VL, but this is them saying this, not me. I'm just a messenger here. Now, they also had some great tips and ways of thinking about entitled CO2 confirmation. One of them says, just as a way of remembering this, you need seven breaths at seven millimeters of mercury to confirm two placement, seven at seven. I like that. Now, they also summarized a phrase that's been going around the UK, no trace, wrong place. I love that phrase, no trace, wrong place. If you don't have that good four-phase waveform for seven breaths, at least at seven millimeters of mercury, tube is in the wrong place. Now, the other finding from this paper is about unevacuated pneumothorax. So 36% of what they called potentially mortal injuries were from moderate to large pneumothorax, again, found on postmortem CT scan. Only 18% of those received chest decompression. We have some work to do here. Now, I definitely have some issues with the methods in this paper, largely, well, because they're not in the paper. They're just not described. I have no idea when the airway misplacement that is seen on CT scan occurred. We have no idea what the physiologic impact of these anatomic findings were. In other words, was that large pneumothorax actually causing tension physiology? And tension physiology, specifically hypotension, is typically what field decompression is limited to. Now, despite this, I think the author's recommendations and takeaways from this paper are sound. Even if I don't have much faith in the precision of the numbers, I think the order of magnitude is probably about right. So they recommend that all patients with blunt traumatic cardiac arrest undergo bilateral chest decompression, 
and they recommend that clinicians should have airway placement confirmation and ongoing monitoring within Title CO2. Now, on these two things, I completely, completely agree. I think they are very reasonable. Well, that's what I have for you today. I hope you found it helpful, or at least interesting. I'd really love to hear from y'all. What do you think about these recommendations? Do you think my son has a future in videography? What EMS topics do you think my daughter should tackle from a research perspective? Y'all can reach me on Twitter, assuming it hasn't spontaneously combusted by now, at at Dr. Jeff Jarvis or email at jeff.jarvis at flightbridgeed.com. Thanks for listening. Take care. You've been listening to the EMS Lighthouse Project Podcast, a proud member of the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast family and a Fire Dog production. Visit flightbridgeed.com for more information.